The federal government has recently made concerted efforts to prevent the media from speaking to government scientists. They accuse the government of Prime Minister Stephen Harper of disrespecting Syrian sovereignty and of taking sides in sectarian conflicts. It didn't take long for the protests to get violent. Snowballs, rocks, and ice were thrown at police during an educational protest. Uh, you can't stop us. It's Radio Free Canada. Hi there. I'm Darren Howard. I'm Robert Nisbet. And I'm Monica Sommer. Yes, we've let a girl into the treehouse again today. I don't know how this Ooh. happened. Girl cooties and news and information that you can't handle. Well, the conservative government can't handle it. You're tuned in to Radio Free Canada. We're starting things off fast. Let's talk about muzzling scientists. Canada's Information Commissioner investigating now whether the federal government is breaking the rules by imposing limits on some scientists and what they can say and when they can speak to the media. The probe comes after a request from the University of Victoria's Environmental Law Clinic wrote to Suzanne Legault complaining about the federal practice. Take a listen to what it says. In sharp contrast to past Canadian practice and the current U.S. government practice, the federal government, they say, has recently made concerted efforts to prevent the media and, through them, the general public, from speaking to government scientists. And this, in turn, impoverishes the public debate on issues of significant national concern. This has raised a lot of questions. Should the federal government's attempt to limit scientists speaking be ruled illegal? Is it really about muzzling scientists, as the report says, with evidence that may refute federal policy? Or is it just fair practice to ensure that federally funded research is properly protected and controlled? So that's how we start off the show with scientists getting muzzled. What do you think? Scary. Kind I, of, I think it's kind of sad when the U.S. is seeming freer than us. The, the Americans are freer than us. The land of the Orwellian nightmare. <laughs> the land of the NDAA. We are here to set you free with massive quantities of information, a little bit of chaos, and a really cool soundtrack. We're going to be talking about Canada and what we're doing right and wrong. Does that sound good? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course, Let's, it may be a little unbalanced, <laughs> but we're not Fox News. We're not fair and balanced. No, no, we're out of the box thinkers. Thanks for joining us. Let's start things off. It's Rick Mercer, and it's Radio Free Canada. Well, another week, another story about scientists in Canada being muzzled. This time it's eggheads up in the Arctic studying climate change, a, a joint project between the Canadians and the Americans. And of course, our government told them they had to sign a piece of paper saying they could never discuss their findings in public unless a political staffer in Ottawa said it was okay which is never going to happen. Now, of course, the Canadians, they did what they were told. They signed on the dotted line because, well, they want to eat. But the American scientists went ballistic because, well, they're Americans, and you know what the Americans are like. It's freedom of speech this, it's freedom of speech that. And the way they were carrying on, you'd swear that they had been transported back in time and dropped behind the Berlin Wall at the height of the Cold War. Nope. <laughs> You're in Canada in 2013. You want to do science in these parts, you better get used to it and get over yourselves. It's not like scientists are the only ones being told to shut up in this country. No, it's everyone. Remember when Canada used to have a Veterans Affairs ombudsman? He used to go on TV every night and scream bloody murder every time the government abused our veterans. Well, he's gone. They got a new guy in there now. Do a Google News search. He barely comes up. And then there's the cabinet. If scientists have been muzzled, Half of the cabinet have had their voice boxes removed. And then there's the backbenchers. They have taken to communicating with a series of blinks and twitches like in a hostage video. So if you are a scientist, don't take it personally. Times have changed. The days of discussing science and your findings in public, they're over. It is a bygone era, like smoking in the supermarket. This is the new Canada. Thank you for not talking. <laughs> okay, so it's true. Okay. It's sad, but true. So they've signed something. Is that right? Scientists have yeah, signed it's something. Like a personal secrets agreement or public safety agreement or something like that. It's kind of messed up. Oh, it is messed up. <laughs> but I mean, you have to ask yourself, is Harper a fascist? Uh, or is he just practicing fascism? I, I would call that fascism for sure. Yeah. Just the label, the intellectual label of fascism yeah. would probably fit here.
Yeah. But okay, uh, why muscle scientists? Because they might tell us something that you know may enrage us. Yes, you know because you know the government's touting how good they are on dealing with climate change. Climate change is the most important issue of our generation. Yeah, and of course, all they be all that our government does and the U.S. government does is hem and haw and say we'll study it some more. And yeah. now they're not even allowing the findings from those studies to come out to the public. Okay, well we're here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just try to keep us quiet. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, try and keep us uh, Try and keep the spirit down. We're going to run a couple of clips here real quick and then give ourselves a moment to talk about it. Uh, expatriates. This is an interesting clip. Yeah, because, you know, we're arming the good terrorists. Okay. Syrians in Canada continue to steadfastly level criticism at the Canadian government and media for siding with terrorist armed gangs that are destroying their country. The Syrian expat community are extremely angry with the government of Canada. They accuse the government of Prime Minister Stephen Harper of disrespecting Syrian sovereignty and of taking sides in sectarian conflicts. Syrians who support the Assad government's peace-oriented reformist platform rather than Western orchestrated armed conflict say the Canadian media is misrepresenting the facts on the ground to Canadians. Uh, unfortunately, here in Canadian media, media, you cannot see the real news. You can see maybe 10 percent maximum, 90 percent hiding from them. I, I think they have their own agenda. Just last week, an independent commission established by the UN's Human Rights Council issued a 131-page report which accused Western-backed anti-government insurgents of committing war crimes in Syria. Syrian expats in Canada accuse the Canadian government and media of aiding and abetting these Al-Qaeda-affiliated, credibly accused war criminals, an allegation which, if true, would seem to belie the repeated assertion of Canada's foreign minister that Canadian foreign policy is motivated by concerns with human rights. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what can you say? Canada's foreign policy is concerned with human rights? Um, aren't our mining interests represented throughout Latin America by our embassies? Uh, yeah, just take a look at Canadian mining interests, okay? Uh, of course, corporations leading the way within that one. We don't hear any information of about course, that. Of course, we got to say, he did put a little bit of spit on that, calling the Assad government a peace-loving government. I'm not sure about that. I have not done enough research into that. Okay, well... I this seems strangely familiar to like the situation of Panama in the U.S. <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> yeah, Noriega yeah. used okay. to be a good like, guy. Yeah. yeah, and how the states actually supported the... What? I, I think I smell a smell here. I think... <laughs> A steaming Not in pile the room. of something. I don't know what that is. Okay, uh, make sure you check our facts, too, because we're not telling you to trust us. And did you want to do this? Oh, you mean the uh, uprising or the re-uprising of the students in Montreal? Uh, yeah, there's another story we haven't heard from. Let's run this, and, uh, and then we'll mock it abjectly. Fantastic. It didn't take long for the protests to get violent. Snowballs, rocks, and ice were thrown at police during an educational protest where an estimated 50,000 protesters across Quebec province descended upon downtown Montreal to protest against hikes in tuition fees. This is perhaps one of the largest demonstrations that has taken place since the PQ took power. Protesters here say they're not only against tuition hikes, but they're for free education. The protest was organized by ASEE, what some say is a radical student group. The group is opposed to the government's decision of a planned 3% tuition hike, which would amount to about $70 a year. Police officers eventually ended up charging at protesters and arrested at least 10 people for assaulting police officers. Quebec students pay the lowest average rate for education in Canada. More demonstrations are planned for next week. Okay, so uh, just to jump right in and be controversial, it seems like they're complaining about, what, $70? Now, the thing is, if they're complaining about a $70 increase, why aren't the rest of the students in Canada up in arms about the amount of money they're paying in tuition fees? There's a thought. What do you think? I mean, why do you think the other students aren't? Freaking. Well, I actually find when I look at national 
uh, look at it nationally, Quebec is the first one to start crying. Right. They are always. Yeah. yeah. And it, it, and I often wonder if it's there's too much pride in the West to say, oh, it's too hard. Oh, we're going to find a way. Uh, yeah. Actually, you got a good point there. Um, we talk about passion because I've got uh, European relatives, and the European seem to have a lot of passion. And they speak. I think a lot of it is the Quebec youth are more politically and socially aware than the rest of the youth in our country. Uh Aha. Okay. You know, because they're they're, there. They've been out there protesting police brutality. They're out there doing this. This was 50,000 students in Montreal. Not a small number. And so I'm not even seeing any of this in the major news at all. I mean, that's a little bit of insulting. No, I see our newspapers are worried about the Kelowna Ballet staying. Oh, man. Yeah, see, okay. But they're not really too upset about Crossroads Addiction Treatment Center being closed. I know. Okay, so this myopia is occurring all over the place. Uh, while we got a chance, I want to fit this clip in. It's about residential schools, so let's check this out. The infamy of Canada's residential school system and their legacy is all too well known. Abuse and violence leading to long-term psychological damage for generations of First Nations people. And those are just the survivors. Now there's new research that shows thousands of children died in the residential schools, at least 3,000, probably more. The CTV Scott Cunningham shows us tonight the survivors on Vancouver Island say they will always remember those who never came home. A research project funded by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission confirms at least 3,000 Aboriginal children died while attending the schools. For the chief of British Columbia's largest First Nation, the numbers cut deep, but they are no surprise. I know of three cases in the residential school I attended, Cooper Island Residential School, where the families have never seen their brother or their sister. Research shows the majority of children died of disease, such as tuberculosis, but others died for reasons the church never explained. As 3,000 children are remembered and mourned, it is likely just the beginning. Researchers expect their work will uncover more names and more bodies. So these are things that we have to start focusing on the repair work, I think. Mm. Okay, that's where my headspace is at. Deep repair. Yeah, we need to start deconditioning and or conditioning joy and peace. Yeah, we got to stop getting away from these things that are messing us up so bad. But we do have to start talking about it to solve the problem, yes? Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I want to run this real quick, a uh, real quick clip just before the end here, uh, because this is also an important story. The facts are outlined in a 74-page document titled Empathy, Dignity, and Respect. The Health Council of Canada released it not too long ago, and what it shows is Aboriginal Canadians face racism and stereotyping when it comes to obtaining health care all throughout the country. So now the independent national agency is calling for cultural competent care so Aboriginal patients can be treated with respect and understanding. But even so, doubt looms among Aboriginals and other Canadians. The Health Council of Canada says while Aboriginal patients arrive, whether it's an emergency room or in a health care center, they're not necessarily seen for who they are and are consequently not respected, and they are not treated as fellow human beings. Because of it, Aboriginal patients are now avoiding care or drop out of treatment programs. The situation is all the more concerning because Aboriginal people have poorer health and shorter life expectancies than other Canadians. According to the report, while factors like poverty and the impact of colonization are known to have an impact on Aboriginal health, a Western approach to health care seems to be reinforcing stereotypes, alienating and intimidating patients. Ashante Hathaway, Press TV, Montreal. As intelligent people, we have to figure out ways to bridge across all this pain. After yes? all, we do live in the true north, strong and free. Yeah, I know, and I'm proud of local Canadians. I mean, like, I'm a proud Canadian. Well, and that's one of the things I loved about hearing some of the speeches at Idle No More, uh-huh. where the actual Native leaders were saying, we can't just hate Harper. Yes. He is part of the system. We have to provide the unity that's in community. And this is coming from the people being persecuted. I think what we really have to do is replace the system with something that works. Mm-hmm. Yes. And get a little bit of that unity down. Absolutely. That's our first 15 minutes, and it's done so fast. Uh, thanks for tuning in. It's Radio Free Canada, baby. And uh, we're going to be right back. Monica Selmark, Robert Nisbet, and myself, Darren Howard. <laughs>